Welcome to Peer to Peer, the podcast, brought to you by Rainer. Listen in as we hear from top surgeons having great conversations with their peers about hot and popular topics in ophthalmology. In this episode, we're highlighting some great content from a conversation that Dr. Carl Stonecipher had with Professor Graham Barrett about the Ray One EMV during Rayner's video series, My Next Ophthalmologist Needs No Introduction. Dr. Carl Stonecipher is the Medical Director of TLC Greensboro in North Carolina and a Clinical Associate Professor of Ophthalmology at the University of North Carolina. Professor Graham Barrett is a consultant ophthalmologist at the Lion's Eye Institute as well as Sir Charles Gardner Hospital in Perth, Western Australia and is a clinical professor in the University Department of Ophthalmology of Western Australia. Listen in as Professor Barrett shares his journey developing the Ray1 EMV and the Barrett Universal Formula. So now we get into kind of the nitty gritty stuff. So I've kind of talked to a lot of people about the Rayner EMV lens. And I'd really like to just dive into that before we talk a little bit about biometry because I don't think people really understand how the lens works. So can you give us some insight into the Rayner EMV? The concept is to try and get something without losing something very important, which is quality of vision. And uh, we all want presbyopic solutions. We all want to provide our patients not only good unaided distance, but some reading ability. And we know that we can do it, but we know the compromises. And you've got to be very careful about who you put a multifocal in. Um, And even with that care, sometimes there's issues and problems, which uh, even require lens explantation. And that's life. Right. And we have alternatives. We have monovision, which uh, works well if you restrict the the amount, maybe to minus one or a quarter. But of course, you're trading off some spectacle independence. And I always felt, was there a way to take that monovision and enhance it to give you a slightly better range, give you good overlap between the eyes, so mm. you've got good fusion between the two eyes, and good stereo and get greater spectacle independence without penalizing from glare, halos, uh, loss of contrast, all those things that we want to stay away from. Right. And that was the basis. I even thought this would be maybe just for the reading eye. And I soon realized it was performing so well, you could put in a distance eye too. You could put in both eyes for distance, one for intermediate, a little bit of reading, but if you want to get true independence, you need to combine it with a modest level of myopia, maybe minus one or so. But the key thing is, when, when, when you do this strategy, you're not losing and penalizing and compromising to the same extent you do with a multifocal. And I've been using this lens exactly as you described. So now I'm monovision, okay? And many of our colleagues have chose monofocal lenses because they were monovision before, but does this really give me more depth of focus, depth of field because of the positive spherical aberration? So when I go to have my cataract surgery and I put this lens in me, what's it going to do for me? Different than what I have now with monovision, you think? When you have monovision, yes, which is a wonderful thing, uh, you know you have to restrict the amount you, you provide, right? or you may run into some issues with um, uh, astenopia and perhaps with lack of stereo and that limits you to what you can actually provide. Uh, what this lens will do and the reason it does so is because of the positive spherical aberration which interacts synergistically with myopia. You won't impact the distance as much and you'll get a bit more. It works together with modest vision, give you that extended range and not to impact your distance as well. So help me, why do we choose positive spherical aberration and not negative? Yes. Can you tell me that? Oh, absolutely. Okay. If you have a level of myopia, you impair the uh, quality of vision to some extent. If you have spherical aberration, you impair it too, if it's positive. If you put the two together, as long as it's myopia and positive, you actually get a better quality vision than you would with either aberration alone. Okay. It's the opposite with negative. So that's the key reason. If you want to leave someone with myopic defocus and you want to extend their depth of focus, if you understand the optics, you need to use positive spherical aberration. 
There's other issues as well. For instance, if you have less than perfect centration with a lens, if you've got negative, and essentially when you use extra negative spherical aberration, you make it even worse, slightest decentration, even minimal, minor, will drop down the MTF, drop down the quality of vision in contrast. This is robust. This is quite tolerant. And uh, so that's another reason for preferring positive. And the third reason, this is what is physiological. This is what we all have probably to some extent and um, even if you say, well, what's the best quality of vision? Well, in the lab, it's zero aberration. Right. But in real life, it's not. The people with the best, the sharpest vision have a little bit, not too much, of positive spherical aberration. This is the range that this lens provides. And with the AVI values and everything that this lens provides, I'm getting more 2016s, more 2012s, more 2020, more 2010. Uh, my enhancement rates, I'm, I'm presenting here at ESCRS or 1.14% with this lens, it's, it's pretty amazing. I have all these patients, you know, I've operated on like 80,000 uh, refractive surgery patients. Is there, you know, like if you've got a hyperope and a prolate cornea versus a myope and an oblate cornea, we all talk about spherical aberration and, and those, is there somebody we shouldn't put this lens in? I mean, are we okay to put it in? Uh, as long as they don't have, let's say, higher to aberrations of 0.45 or higher. We all know that those are yeah. special patients, but they've got, you know, uh, astigmatism less than 0.75, because most of those do, because we're good laser vision correction surgeons, and most of them have normal corneas, and we're not going to put it in a bad dry eye, so I'm not going there. I'm just saying if I've got somebody like me who I've got good quality of vision, you know, I've got myopic LASIK or hyperopic LASIK, anybody we don't want to use it in that instance. Theory is, as you know, yes. if you've got existing positive spherical aberration and you add more, are you going to extend into a range which is going to impact the MTF and the quality? The reality is that with modern LASIK and large ablation zones, the amount of positive that is induced is really small. And so adding the extra small amount would just extend the range of vision and not uh, would not be likely to be a problem. If you want to be really, really safe, though, mm -hmm. and you're not sure about that eye, for instance, check the amount of spherical aberration. And of course, if you're nearing the 0 0.3, 0 0.4 range, then I would be cautious. Okay. Opposite with hyperopic uh, treatments. Um, because in that situation, the negative is not going to interact in a destructive fashion. It's going to actually help. Yeah. Okay. And, and RK, I'd be cautious, of, of course. course, because unlike myopic LASIK, the aberration can be quite high. But for instance, Carl, if you do a patient who's had hyperopic LASIK or PRK, uh, in theory, you shouldn't use a negative serial aberration lens. Right. But do you? <coughs> you Every now and then. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I do. Um, because the, you know, the corrections are fairly small. Right. So often the theory doesn't always translate into clinical practice. Okay. So I'd say I'd be cautious um, if I was concerned that this was not a minus two modern laser correction, but something like a minus 10 done in the early years when the optical zones were small. Right. I would be cautious, either not do it, but if I was going to do it, be sure to measure how much was there beforehand. Okay. So I'm going to change gears a little bit because I know Warren Hill, Jack Holliday, Olson, all these guys are my good friend, but your form is doing really well. And I happened to be there 20 years ago, I think, is when we started with Oscarus with you when we were on South Island in New Zealand, as we were talking about earlier. Um, the formula, where, where did you get into biometry? And so now we've got all these, these formulas to choose from. Yours is kind of winning in the range of these difficult patients, but it's doing great in the normal patients as well. So give us kind of the development of the Barrett formulas. It's a fascinating story because it's never been um, my primary focus until recent years. Uh, but it goes back to about 1985, 1986. And it started when I first implanted hydrophilic foldable lenses in 83, changed the refractive index you know, 1.43 instead of 1.49. Right. Uh, asymmetrical biconvex, strange haptics. There was no formula available that I could use implanting this lens for the very first time. No history to go by. Right. 
So I needed a formula that I could plug in these different indices, these parameters, refractive index, radius of curvature, and that's why I called it universal. And that's how it began. It was uh, problem driven. I needed a solution for this much more exciting project I was right. doing. Turns out, you know, 30 years later, that the formulae, uh -huh. you know, could argue of more value than most of the other exciting things. Oh, no, that's, that's pretty cool. Ethics, which is a strange story, yeah. isn't it? Well, you're, sh you're changing so many people's lives and you don't even know half of them, or many of them. Yeah, and for many years, I just used this formula quite happily. Right. Um, you know, I remember you presenting it at Oscars. Uh, you know? No, but it was, you know, it was a side interest, wasn't it? For a new user, mm -hmm. okay, I know we want to collect our A constants and I know we want to data collect and we want to look at three months is where I look at my data. So I want to get into the Rainer EMV. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I want the perfect patient. You know, for me, it's less than three quarters of a doctor of cylinder, although we can fix that, you know, if we need to. But who's your first patient's going to be? I'm a new user. I, I don't think the restrictions that we are usually associated with using multifocals apply at all. I agree. And so I'd be happy to put it in, I can't say anyone. Right. Almost anyone. Right. So there's no specific things I would say, you know, is this personality correct? Is this person easygoing? You don't need that. If they've got a cataract. Right. Okay. And you want to make them see better, you can use this lens. And I've got a lot of athletes. You know, a lot of special forces in the in the realm we're in, and these are people that maybe I've done laser vision correction on before, and and it, it's performing well at night, it's performing well during the day. They're getting the vision that they had before, and those people that are maybe a great golfer, like a four handicap or less, or a great tennis player, like a five zero or better, you know, they're saying that this lens gives them that quality, but then they can go sit and chat afterwards and still read the menu and, and perform like they need to on the court or on the golf course, but at the same time, they can, they can still see the menu in dim lit or bright conditions. Yes, um, we got caught up very much in spectral independence as a criteria of patient satisfaction. Right. And I think there was pretty much a blind pathway. Yeah. And we're coming to realize, and we realize with modest monovision, we're realizing with EDF as well, that yes, they do not want to be totally dependent, but having to put specs on occasionally if it's tiny print, but doing their day-to-day -day menu and you know, casual reading and their phone particularly, right. that's the criteria of satisfaction. Thank you all for listening. You can watch this episode of My Next Ophthalmologist Needs No Introduction and more on Rainer's peer-to-peer -peer hub at rainer.com forward slash peer to peer. Stay tuned for episode five of Peer to Peer the podcast, where host Mr. Paul Rosen features content from a past Rainer webinar on premium IOLs and specifically the Ray One EMV with speakers Mr. Andrew Turnbull and Mr. Alon Barsam. For more information about this episode's topic and to read the show notes, visit the Peer to Peer hub at rainer.com forward slash peer to peer. This podcast is provided for general information purposes only. The presenter's views are their own. Rainer does not endorse off-label use. Users must refer to the product labeling and instructions for use for Rainer products in all cases. Not all Rainer products are available in all countries. The full disclaimer can be found in the show notes.